Okay, everyone. Well, welcome to coming. Uh, thank you for coming to Connecticut Horror Fest. Happy to have you, and thank you for coming to this panel on Children of the Corn. If it gets any hotter in here, it's going to be popcorn. But uh, I've been I've been waiting to say that. I've actually it's, it's been, been a while. Uh, but um, I think anyone who grew up in the '80s, like myself, or if you found it later, remembers seeing Children of the Corn for the first time. It was released in 1984. And uh, it, it was released the same year with uh, Friday the 13th, The First Nightmare on Elm Street, Firestarter. It came in fourth that year in the box office for horror films. And I think a lot of us, children of the 80s, found it perhaps on HBO. Perhaps we saw it in the movie theater if we're old enough. We're not old enough. And, um, and at your local video store. I think this was a, a movie that a lot of us remember. And of all the ones that came out in the 1980s, it's one that's still very recognizable and um, it's one that fans really respond to. So, without further ado, I would like to introduce the stars of Children of the Corn, John Franklin and Courtney Gaines. Please, come on. Okay, we're gonna start out just by uh, starting with some of the, uh, there's a lot of certain stories that you could tell but how did each of you individually become involved in this, in this film? Take it, John. Well, i originally from Chicago. Um, I had saved up money after college. Yes, I was 24 and I did children work. Uh, got my union cards and I knew because I looked 12 years old and being over 18 this is what they wanted so you could work as an adult. No child labor laws, no adult guardian, no teacher on the set and all that stuff. They saved a lot of money. Um, so I went out and I had done my research. I found out what agents I wanted to stop by and visit and drop off my picture resume. And one of them was the agent, uh, Tony Kelman, that started Jodie Foster, a lot of the Brady Bunch of kids. And so I said, oh, Jodie Foster did pretty well. So I went in person, because I know being, I didn't want to just, you know, there was no email back then. It was just like mail it or something. So I went in and I just introduced myself and I, they said, how old are you? And I said, oh, you know, I think I was still 23, it was May uh, of that year, of 83. And they were like, what? And they said, if you can act, we're signing you right now. So they had me read like a Doritos commercial, I remember, and then another scene from something else. And they're like, wow, and they signed me right then on the spot. And they were, set, they were gonna send me out on a bunch of interviews to meet people, just like a look-see with casting directors at Universal and some other places. And I was just trying to get the names right. We were just talking about how bad we are at names, remembering names. So I went to the secretary, and I was like, so I had already met that one theatrical agent, the commercial agent, and then I went to the secretary. I said, and, and what is your name? She said, I'm Tony Kelman. So she was the owner of the agency. She's the one that discovered Jodie Foster. The secretary that day, the real one, was sick and out. So she was just answering the phones and filling in while, you know, they didn't have temp agency. So they sent me out, and three weeks later, three weeks later, I got children in the corner. What was the question? <laughs> How did you become involved in it? In fact, I think there's an interesting story about your casting. Right, right, right. So how I got the gig, right? So, uh, so there's two, yeah, so two things. So um, when I went in for the role, I had this, uh, one of those knives with the, you know, the, the spring that goes, you know, in my pocket, which I didn't know whether I was going to use or not. And I, uh, when I was reading with the reader who ended up being our voice guy, I pulled it, put it right under his throat. He, he couldn't tell whether it was real or not, and about wet himself. And uh, his name's Jeff Greenberg. Went on to be a huge casting director who never hired me ever. And uh, he's still casting Modern Family right now. Yeah, so Cheers, yeah, little things like that. Yeah. But uh, that was pretty much what sealed the deal, because I, I certainly scared him, so I guess they figured if I could scare him, I could scare somebody else. And then I had to come back for the callback where John had already gotten the job. It was down, I guess, to me and a couple guys, and I just grabbed you know, him by his lapels and just you know shook him real good, and I guess that sealed the deal. Yeah. Um, in in a, a recent interview, I heard um, the screenwriter uh, for your role of Isaac, John, uh, said you were the little Ayatollah of the film. Um, what do you make of that statement, and how did you prepare for the role of this, you know, the, the preacher? 
Well, um, before I moved from Chicago that same summer before I moved, I had just done, or the, the fall, the spring run, I had just done a play called The Innocents, and in it the kid is possessed, they made a movie out of it, um, and then he dies at the end dramatically. So. But I was just kind of, when I went, I just hadn't watched any research, like any you know preachers on TV or anything like that. And then, but I just you channeled that possessed kid in the audition, and then by the time I got to you know, the part, um, and they told me pretty much right away I was cast because they were worried about finding someone over 18 who could pull it off. Um, I, then I started watching late night TV, and people always go, "Did you watch Boy Preachers?" I'm like, "No, I just always felt that Isaac was just uh, adult, even though he was like, you know, 12, 13, whatever. He was still." In his mindset, he was an adult. He would not watch boy preachers. So I watch a little late night TV and throw that in there. And, and um, you know, just just today, Courtney walking around the lines and managing the lines today, I, I heard a lot of people uh, commenting, you know, with the earshot of me, like, "Oh, here's that that guy from Children of the Corn," and and we're that redheaded freak. <laughs> and they were they were frightened, I think, to even go and see you. Um, you're. You, you, you sort of uh, typified like this classic frightening bully, I think, for a lot of kids that saw it. Um, where did that come from in, in your... It came from getting bullied in the hood, my friend. <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, I grew up in pretty tough neighborhoods in L.A. and all of that. And um, also, I always say a lot of the bad guys I played, I based on my brother. I don't know, much older brother, like much older, but he was like... Uh, his name was Mike, they called him Mad Mike. He, in high school he ran with a Samoan biker gang. And that's like, no lie. And so he was so he was tough. So I learned how to play tough guys from growing up in a tough neighborhood. And uh, you know, uh, Linda Francis, who cast this, had, had uh, seen me in a showcase and uh, tried to get me in a couple other things. I got very close on like when I got in the movie fell apart. So she really championed me to get this job. So I really owe the start of my career to her. <laughs> Um, can you talk to us, uh, really both of you, uh, about the location and as far as like um, how that affected the, the, you know, the film and, and what your memories are of filming in, in Iowa, correct? It was in yes. Iowa? Sioux City, Iowa. <laughs> uh, the, the, the couple things about that that really stood well, number one, I like shooting on location. I like being out of L.A. with no distractions. It's like you're the circus, you come to town, you do your thing and you leave. Um, the first thing I really remember about it was uh, the explosion. They did the explosion early on when we were shooting, the one at the end. And I'd never seen an explosion like that, so I was all excited. And uh, I remember it ended up taking forever, like till three in the morning or something. I remember getting sick. I was just out there so like, waiting for it to happen. But it was an amazing thing to see this huge explosion. And the other thing I remember was just the, going into the cornfield itself, you know, our trailers would be, you know, further away, and you'd go through this sort of, this little trail to the actual open area, and I remember just kind of getting geeked up, like almost like uh, stepping onto a football field into an arena kind of thing, you know, where you're just, you're getting geeked, you're getting geeked, and you get in there, and it's just like game on, you know. I would be looking at the director, to be trying to give me direction, and I'd be in that, you know, like the Malachi sketch there, you know, and he'd be like, are you all right? I'm like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> That's the one right there. <laughs> Uh, again, it's, it is wonderful being on location because you're not going home, you're not you know, reading, getting to have to deal with any of you know, the dogs or acting bad today or whatever. And it's like, so you're just there and you've got the hotel and we just all bonded, a lot of us. And uh, the director had told Courtney not to talk and not to be nice to any of the kids, to keep that going even off the set. Um, I would have breakfast every morning with either Peter Horton or Lynn Hamilton. We were in Howard Johnson's in the little cafe downstairs if we were working or being on the set. And um, you also tell Peter not to be nice to me, and he still hasn't been nice to me to this day. <laughs> <laughs> Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> uh, it's just it was so cool, and the, and the kids that they got were from the you know, high school, local high school drama club or community theater. Some of the people in the cafe were you know, from their community theater, and they were just so excited to be there. I mean, I remember the the ladies that worked at the Howard Johnsons when we checked out after like three four weeks. They're just crying because we all became so close. It was just really really a sweet, innocent thing. It was just very different, and of course it was our first film too, so it was just a whole new experience. Uh, you mentioned Peter Horton, but you also worked with uh, Linda Hamilton in one of her first roles. She was very nice. Linda's very nice. <laughs> what, what do you want to know? <laughs> I, got, I got one for you. So she said in a recent interview that, or I'm not sure how recent it is, but interview, and you could see it in the scene with, with her, to be rough 
and kind of take it, you know, to, to really, really live it in, in a way. Um, what what was that like? Because it certainly, I mean, I, I watched the film again a, a week ago, and it really stands out in terms of that you're seen with her, and it, it's very believable. So uh, I got two Linda Hamilton stories. One is the first day I shot, which was actually the first scene you see me come out of the cornfield when she's in that dream sequence. So that was really cool. It's literally the first shot, and it's the first shot I ever did on film. Um, then there's where she gets scared, right? Like that the, the so what they did was they actually snuck the real guy under the sheet, telling her it was a dummy, and then he really jumped. Uh, Jonah did jumped up and scared the piss out of her. But she was a great, you know, great. She she laughed about it afterward, but you know she was a great spirit about the whole thing. And then the other one was in the the famous scene where I'm saying outliner. So she's like she was like, go ahead, you know, you can be tough, you know. Rough. It was my first film. I didn't know better. I if you look, you can see my fingers are like inside her cheek, you know. And the next day she you know she had all these broken corpuscles on her face, and I felt really bad and learned that you know you don't do that. <laughs> And uh, John, any um, Actually, I had no scenes with Linda Hamilton. Uh, it looks like we're looking down at her on the cross, but nobody was there. She wasn't there. We were just like, looking down. And then they cut away to her actually being lifted up on the cross. But that was another day that I didn't work. So again, it's just editing. But it was always there, so nice. Uh, about four or five years later, I did a guest star on Beauty and the Beast. Uh, with Ron Perlman and Linda Hamilton. And we didn't have any scenes with that either, because I was the young beast in flashbacks. So I got to work with Rick Baker, five hours of makeup, it was really cool. But we bumped into each other in the uh, wardrobe fitting, and she was just, yeah, she ran over and stuff. And so she was just very, very nice. About two or three years ago, I met her again yeah. in Texas at another big convention there. And we just popped over and she ran over, and she hugged me so tight, and she just said, are you happy? I was just like, what a beautiful, sweet thing to say, you know? No, I hate my life! <laughs> uh, it was okay. But she was really cool. You know, there's, I don't believe, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe either of you were in that sort of uh, famous scene that was supposed to be cut from the film with the blue man, you know? I don't know if you hear the lore about that or whatever, but was that... Have you, have you, are you aware of any of this? You know, it's like, I've heard this from various fans and stuff that, oh yeah, the blue man scene was cut and that actor who played the cop had some oh, extras. Right, one, yeah. But yeah, I've never seen anything besides just like the little sketch drawings that they had. Of, yeah, it doesn't seem to it, it it exist or at least be <laughs> released at this point. So it's a whole new movie, the blue man. Right, yeah. the blue man group. Yeah. The, um, now, what about as far as the, um, we mentioned about the locations, but you also hear a lot of people who grew up in the Midwest in those cornfields, that this sort of uh, had a Jaws effect on them as far as the uh, being afraid of those, of those cornfields? Have you heard stories about no, that? it's absolutely true. We hear it all the time. We, we, you know, we do conventions. That's, we hear people that, you know, especially those who grew up around cornfields, you know, they said they were, after that, they were scared to death. But people who say they can't go in them because of it. it is, I always say it, it's like the Jaws to water. That's what I say. I mean, we'll forever be associated with corn. Yes. Do you have any memories of uh, working with the director or with any of the other uh, people on set? Uh, working with the director, I mean, it just was always just, I remember like him being very intense and uh, mainly I remember working with Jeff Greenberg, who was the dialogue coach, who went on to be the guy pulled the knife on that director. Guy, yeah. uh, so he was there and he would run lines with us the night before our scenes that we were shooting. So he was just always you know, making sure we were off book and knew our lines. And I just remember that more and then running lines with, you know, Courtney and, and this, it was our first movie. I was like so determined to do a great job and, you know, not mess up. And they started because I, my first scene ever on film was the big preaching scene. And it's not just like walk here, you know, you just walk, stop wherever you want. You know, there's marks along the way. And he who walks behind the rows, you gotta be here. You, know, you must just say, I'm sending out vendors amongst you. you be there. So it's just, they started calling me One Take Franklin because I was so scared. I was just, I had to be perfect. And so I was always knew my lines and hit my marks and did my job. 
Uh, yeah, Fr Fritz Kirsch is his name. He's a good guy. Um, he got a number of films he did in the 80s, Tough Turf. and uh, he, uh, I had a good time working with him. He always made me feel at ease. Like I said, though, you always thought, is this guy listening to anything I say? Because I was looking like I was going to eat him for lunch. But uh, I think once he saw I could hit my marks, he was comfortable. He went on to, uh, he went on to be a, a film school teacher in Oklahoma uh, for years. Um, and I, I, he just moved, started being a, I forget where he just went, went somewhere else. But he like kind of put the whole film school thing on the map out in Oklahoma City. Um, as, as far as, you know, it, the reception of the film, both at the time and you know up to today, I guess that's two questions. But what were your impressions of it, the film after it was completed? When it, when you saw it, if you saw it in, in a theater, or when you if you, you know your reception afterwards, and then today that it's still a lot of '80s movies are forgettable, certainly horror movies, but this one has endured. Do you have any you know, thoughts on why? Um, well, the first part, uh, they invited. Uh, they didn't know who was going to do the national tour uh, for publicity. So they invited uh, me, Linda Hamilton, and Peter Horton. So the three of us we were in a small screening room at one of the studios, and it was probably it's still a rough cut, but we watched the whole thing. And when I look in the, you know, the window to start the massacre, I was like, creeped out, of, ah! But we watched it, and I just thought, wow, this is so wonderful and well done. And I just, I still love the music. I just think the music is just brilliant and really elevated it uh, to a level of really terrifying horror. Um, and then it just it just maintains because now you have people who you know older people that were you know kids then and now their parents and they're showing it to their kids who are now showing it to their kids so it's like once you become a parent the idea of being killed by your kids is really scary <laughs> so i think that just kind of generation it's really really cool seeing third generation reading. I was not invited to the rough cut. <laughs> and uh, I have seen it on Hollywood Boulevard because I'm from LA with a bunch of my friends and my family. And uh, that was a pretty amazing experience. And my mother was like, you know, terrified. And my father was like, I did not realize you had that much anger in you, son. <laughs> Little did he know he was right. Um, uh, but I think the big thing was just the ops, you know, did not know what we were in for and did not, you know, seeing people reacting everywhere we went, you know, kids running down the street crying to their parents when they would see us and stuff. You know, we both had these experiences and I was just not mentally ready for any of that. It was pretty overwhelming, to be honest. You know, there's, just like with all the properties from the 80s, they're so hot right now, there's always talk about a reboot or a remake or something like that. How do you think that would translate in, in, in today's world? Uh, do you think it would work? Do you think it would work as a, as a period piece from like a, a earlier times? There's, there's been 10 things already, and sci-fi already right. did a remake, so I, I mean, I guess it's, I guess they can keep going. Somebody came up to me and said, there's a new one that just came out, Runaways. Yeah, which I didn't even know uh, about. I didn't so. even know about it, so I'm like, but I do know that they have to either have something in development or crank one out, otherwise they lose the rights. So these producers want to hang on to that. You know, and he did 666. He wrote, co-wrote, starred, you know. Supposed to bring me in on that one, and I he know. didn't either. I don't know. We had, they said, write whatever you want. So we had this whole big monster scene in the beginning where we're both in like this insane asylum, and then it blows up, and Courtney comes out all on flames and disfigured, and, and then we go on, and we're like taking over. And then the producers like read it, and they were like, we can't afford this. This is a straight to DVD project. Why did you do it? We're like, you told us to write whatever we wanted. So we had to go back and really t tone it down. And, and they said, sorry, no, Courtney, Malachi's gone. And like, Malachi, he was, you cracked his neck in the cornfield. Don't you forget? Did you forget that? <laughs> like, well, I was kind of chewed up and burned up. <laughs> you were in a coma. I got an explanation. The, um, <laughs> the, um, speaking of budgets, you know, um, the first you know film, your film was, was made on a, on a small budget for sure. Uh, and as far as special effects, um, there were a few scenes, you know, with, with the with the creature, of course, in the um, in the cornfield and such, and, and the explosion, like you said. Like, what were your memories of, of seeing those uh, those effects done? Some were practical. 
Yeah, I thought the practical effects were, were actually, I mean, really clever. You know, it's just a, a trench, you know, with, with a cloth over it and dirt, and, you know, you run a wheelbarrow through it. Like, brilliant. Still looks great to this day. And then, you know, the corn opening up is just, you know, a fishing line. Like, those are great. The, the explosion at the end, even back in the 80s, sucked. It looked like the Grinch. You know, that was honestly the biggest disappointment with the movie, in my opinion. I was like, what the hell is that? You know, you, you go for that big payoff, and that, that shows you what the budget was. Um, but the rest of the stuff, I thought that the stuff they used their minds was actually quite good. I agree. <laughs> I think we have some time for some questions if, if anyone would like. Uh, yes, I called and told you all to come here with questions. Right, so. I have some questions. So uh, I think I could just bring the, the microphone over. Okay, right over here. First again. <clears throat> so I don't want to fangirl too much, but I think you're both amazing. I'm a huge fan of Courtney's. So I have to say that not only were you in Can't Buy Me Love, awesome. The scene, like I just think like you were so stellar in that. Absolutely. But most importantly, you were in The Burbs, which I think is one of the best movies ever. And I need to know about Hans. How did you get like in that whole situation? Because he's an amazing character. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, so I kind of got the job fairly Easily at that point, I was kind of rolling a little bit, and I just had to go take a meeting with Joe Dante. I didn't really have to audition. How were you? There wasn't a ton of lines, right? So uh, we took a meeting, and he gave me the job. And then uh, he really knew exactly what he wanted in terms of the look. So like he, you know, he, he started, you know, with this haircut, and then I had to go get these false teeth made. And every time they'd show him the next thing in the wardrobe that he picked, he just kept laughing, going, "You're never gonna work again." <laughs> Um, and my big key to that character, if you will, was um, what I you know, really felt was he was like a stranger in a strange land, right? So it was sort of like the essence of a deer in the headlights, you know? That really literally is what I was going for. It was that just like, what the hell is going on? I don't know what I'm doing here. And it seemed like it, it clicked, you know, it worked. So that's my burp story. I was not invited to have a meeting with Joe Dante. <laughs> Because I didn't get to go to the screening of Children of the Corn. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or even. I think we had another question up, up front here. Hi, so I know that you were saying too that um, you couldn't really be nice to them, like offset to kind of try to stay in your character. Yeah. So were there any scenes that you felt that you got really into it that it actually scared you? Or like you guys were actually afraid when filming? You know, like, you, like it felt too real? Well, most of my scenes, I'm so under control. And uh, the only final thing was, I was up on the cross, and, you know, and they had a little flashlight. There it is. And they, uh, it was so cold, and it was late at night, and they were like, I was the only one on the set, the only actor. And they would like, keep lowering the cross, it goes, went backwards, and then they'd cover me up with a big you know, blanket between takes and stuff. And finally, I'm going, forget this, just leave me up and let's get this sucker done, because it was like so cold, I was shivering and stuff. So, and then they had like this little flashlight, it was like so low key, it was like, okay, pretend the monster's climbing up your body, I'm gonna eat you. So, but it's just, and it was so cold that whatever equipment, sound equipment they had back in 83, it froze and it just went I had to go into a sound stage and dub that entire intense, you know, I was good, I swear it. It was like, it was, like, it was just intense. Because yeah, you have to match your lips, you have to match the intensity, the acting. So was, they were like, wow, you should do this for a living. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, um, yeah, I'm a little bit of a method type guy anyway, you know, uh, but I, I believe, you know, you have to be uh, responsible and, you know, take care of the other actors around you and don't do anything crazy. But I'm trying to get all the way in there as, as far as I can. And uh, this movie, out of maybe any of them, to be honest, uh, the, the, the quote, the quote, the quote they call the muse, you know, comes, something that sort of takes you over. It did happen. It happened, like I said, every time I'd be walking into that cornfield, uh, and when I tell them I'd hit that field, I would just, and a lot of times I'd be, I'd be, be ready to go, and they'd say action, I'd literally feel like this energy would just come through me and then out. It was kind of a, you know, even though it's obviously a horror film, and like they, it didn't feel like it was like dark energy or something like that, but it, but it was definitely energy, and it, it uh, you know, it was kind of a spiritual experience in that way, to be honest. So, it was pretty powerful. Any other questions? We can uh, get a microphone over to you, right over here up front. Thank you. So um, I was one of the ones that 
the corn was like a jaws for me. When I was a kid, I used to go away to uh, to my family reunions, and we'd all play in the corn, and like the ball would go in there, and I'd just stop and be like, somebody else go get it. I <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so I've wanted... seen the ending of this movie. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So, um, two things. One, I want to know what you guys thought of the sequels. And two, I noticed, John, that you were, I was looking at IMDb, and you were uh, either the voice for Chucky in Child's Play 1 or the, you know, so I want to know about the first part. Uh, Chucky. I did the voice of, they originally hired me, Brad Dourif was in Europe, and they could not get a hold of him. So they started having me dub the entire movie. So I was like, I was like in the studio for a, a weeks and just going Santa Maria, so no, no, the whole incantation thing. And then finally they're like, Oh, Brad, we got Brad. He's coming back. <laughs> and, but then the director uh, said, Oh, well, let's give you something so you're still in there. So my voice by then was so trashed. So they said, You're going to do the walkabout, Chucky. So when the kids eating cereal and watching the TV commercial, Hey kids, you are the Chucky doll, don't you? And I was, that's why my voice is like so gravelly and scratchy. And so, but I'm still in there. And then the credits is walk about Chucky. So that's kind of cool. <laughs> Part two. <laughs> sequels. Oh yeah, sequels. Um, okay. 666 was terrible. <laughs> I actually haven't seen any of them but that one, so John was great in that. <laughs> so I can't say anything about the other ones. I, I think I saw part of the sci-fi one, and I just uh, I, I just think it's unfair to compare, you know, that guy having to redo Malachi to, to mine. I think that's just a ridiculous comparison, so I don't, you know, I don't think that's fair. I think the guy did a fine job. I had to watch them. <laughs> My cousin, who's going to be here later on, uh, who lives in Brooklyn, is coming up. We co-wrote the screenplay for 666, and we wanted to watch two, three, four, or five to make sure that we weren't copying anything or to see if there was anything that we really wanted to carry over. And, and then we just said, mm, no. So we just said, let's just go from one to six, pretend two to five never happened, and we did. So, but I, and I never saw anything after that. Someone at one convention came running up and handed me the DVD for the sci-fi remake and said, you have to watch this. So it's sitting in my office in the closet somewhere. I'm going, do I really want to spend 90 minutes when everybody says don't waste your time? So I read a book. <laughs> uh, any other questions we uh, take? Okay, right over here, up front. The man with the mask. <laughs> yeah, um, I just want to say in the movie Corner of the Cornfield, was there any sh scenes that you just like messed up on your lines? I had no lines, I don't think. Uh, <laughs> As I said before, no. I mean, I was so terrified. One take Franklin. One take Franklin lines. I, I, I inserted commas when I was talking, but they should be. It was like I followed the script exactly, hit on my mark, so. No, other projects I've worked on recently as they get older. <laughs> I just did a guest star fresh off the boat last uh, this year, and I'm going, oh my god, I can't remember these lines. I'm really struggling. I think we had a question in the back over there. We'll get there in just one second. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Courtney. Um, it's a two-part. <laughs> I'm laughing because we talked already. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, the movie Winners Take All <laughs> that nobody else here knows. Yeah, yeah and this is for me. I realize that. <laughs> uh, uh, one, do you realize the cult following that you have with that movie? Just the legion of motocross kids that grew up uh, with that movie and how important it was to them. And no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm here to tell you. All right. It was important. Cool. And uh, number two, uh, do you have any fond memories from filming the movie or anything you can recall from the shooting of that movie? Excellent question. So I did this little motorcycle movie called Winner Take All, and uh, it was the same guys that ended up uh, doing Can't Buy Me Love, a couple, company called Apollo Films, that then Touchstone ended up picking up Can't Buy Me Love, and that was a, ended up being a big deal. The coolest thing about shooting that movie was we got to go to the, um, the Superdome in Dallas, you know, the, the, and actually film why there was real races going on. 
So it was pretty crazy, because I mean, they were really, yeah, they, we, they, we, the starting line, they'd take off and we'd like run to some mark where we're supposed to be safe. I mean, you know, some guy got have crashed and run us over or something. But it was so exciting to actually be on the field and you really realize how, you know, you see when you're in the stands, like, oh, these are like high jumps. Now when you're out there, you realize these guys are like, you know, I mean, what they're doing is insane. You know, so it was a pretty amazing experience to get to watch these guys race and see what they really do up close. And you see what a pro looks like, you know. So it was a pretty awesome experience. Okay, maybe one Thank more you for that. Uh, question in the back there, right? I'll stand. Um, <laughs> have you guys ever heard of uh, South Park? The cartoon show that's been around yes. for over 20 yes. years? Um, they did an episode about the movie. Would you guys think of it? Or any other TV show or other movie try to like recreate that movie or some of the scenes? I think the episode South Park was like wasn't Cartman was Isaac kind of thing and he was like taking over my persona. So I guess I yeah. did see that. It was really funny. Um, there's been so many references. You also you're watching a sitcom and they go, "What is this? You guys are the children of the corn." And it's like, it was like so it's always still there. It's like constantly coming up. So it's, it's cool to be a you know, cultural reference. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It was funny. And I think it's cool. What I like about it is when people do that is they're, it's not, not everybody knows that reference. So they're like, those guys are saying like, this is our kind of humor. Either you get it or you don't. And that, that even makes it better. You know, it's kind of an inside joke. Absolutely. Uh, well, I want to uh, thank Courtney and John for spending some time with us today. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, for, thanks for coming out. Good crowd. Thank you very much. Thank you. Go see them in the uh, autograph area. We'd be happy to see you down there. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Great shows today. <laughs>